just simply reading the text. All right? So, we decided that we would um, really get into it right away with the word submit. Our author, Heather Davis, says that's probably the most controversial of all the words. And so we're loaded, all right? We have the word submit. Wow. That's chapter 8, pages 107 to 125. I encourage you to read the chapter during the week if you haven't had a chance to read yet. That word submit. And we're going to do something. We're not going to do a lot of this this morning, but we are going to start out with just finding like you're sitting together here. What I want you to do is just grab some people next to you. I want you to discuss simply what synonyms or ideas come to mind when you think of the word submit. When you hear the word submit, what jumps to mind right away? Okay? And we're only going to take a couple minutes on this. So just gather around, introduce yourself to someone next to you, about four people in a group, and just discuss it. Go. What comes to mind when you hear the word submit? Turnover, turnover, giveaway, yeah. 
Okay. I, I, I cheated and took a thesaurus and looked up some words for it. Succumb, yield, defer, bow, move, suggest, offer, advance, propose. I don't think I heard any of those from any of you. But we all have certain ideas that come to mind when we heard the word submit. And submit is one of those hot buttons. I asked Heather a question. I wrote her a, a text message and said, Heather, before you became a Christian, did you hear the word submit? Oh, yeah. And you think that she had a positive idea about or a negative? Pretty negative. Look at the top sheet, the introduction. That's from her book. She said that our culture changed when the advent of the pill. She said there was a change. All of a sudden, we, we looked at things a little differently. Women and their role in society and culture. And this became almost like a, a black eye. And I know a lot of people would just rather just skip right over the text from Ephesians, which we'll get to a little later this morning. A real difficult conversation, because it just doesn't seem to fit very well with where we are as a culture. So, this really is a loaded word. <coughs> All right. What I decide we're going to do is, first we'll just review her dictionary definition from the Oxford English Dictionary there on your sheet. I think you have some things there. Um, to place oneself in a position of submission or compliance. Probably the word submission is the one that probably bothers us a bit, perhaps some of us. Number two, to place oneself under a certain control or authority. Do we have any police officers here today? Honestly, I think it's really difficult to be a police officer today in America. We have, as a society, a real problem number two, place oneself under a certain authority. That's being challenged all over our nation, isn't it? Number three, to surrender oneself to judgment, correction, treatment, state of affairs, the condition, etc. And then she says to us that submitting is always an act of free will. That's kind of fill in the blank in your sheet. Submitting is always an act of free will. <coughs> Do you believe that? No? Why not? Oh, we, often, we may struggle against it. You use a wrestling analogy. He might struggle, but then at the end of the day, even the wrestler, if he's pinned, you realize that you got me. And then... Okay, beat. All right. All right. So, we might wonder, hmm. All right. Well, this is from Heather's book, all right? <laughs> Submitting is always an act of free will. Page 108, you can read that and think through that a little bit more on your own. We're not going to stop and get hung up on any of these things. We're going to keep going here. Today's word became loaded because of its use in a handful of Bible passages to speak to the inner relationship of men and women. It's kind of like just a, uh, an add-on to what we read in the introduction. This really is a loaded word. And a lot of times it's a deal breaker. There are people that say, I don't anything to do with a religion that teaches that. It is. Some people have left the church over this, or have decided I don't have anything to do with it, ever, because of it. So it's not as to say this is, we're starting out with a real loaded word. How do we speak about it? To our friends who aren't part of the Christian faith? Do we just ignore it? Hope it doesn't come up? Well, let's look at the word. I decided we take a little biblical perspective, so we're going to jump into God's Word, and don't know if you brought your Bibles, you brought your little words, but I've got the, the text on the screen. This is the very first time the word submit is used in Scripture. And wouldn't you know, in sixth grade religion class this last week, we, had, we were right there in that story. And I thought, huh, this is the word we're going to have for Sunday, submit. 
In Genesis 16, we read, Then the angel of the Lord told her, Go back to your mistress and submit to her. Now that means nothing. Because you have no idea what the context is. So here's the context. Abraham. After the days of Noah, God told Noah once again when he told Adam Eve, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth with people. After Noah, lots of people were born. And scripture records some of the people in the families that are born. And in that description, we have this guy, Abraham. And then the next chapter, we read that God called Abraham. And he made a covenant with Abraham. And he knew this promise of a savior. And basically said, Abraham, from your family line, the savior is going to come. From your family line. And you will be a large family. And those who bless you will be blessed, and those who curse you will be cursed. And it sounds great. Only one problem. He's 75 years old, and Sarah, Sarai, Abram, Sarai, Sarah, Sarah is barren. No kids. And so Sarah has a maidservant. Her number one female aide is Hagar. And Sarah decides that she can't wait for God. So she says to Hagar, Hagar, you go and be with my hubby. That he can have a child for you. That's a soap opera story, isn't it? And so she takes him up on it, or takes her up on it. And of course, then what happens to Sarah? She gets real envious and jealous, both. Envious and jealous, both those words come into play. And she treats Hagar very poorly. Harshly is what it says in, in scripture. Harshly. She's not kind to her. Hey, I'm doing what you asked me to do, and now you don't want anything to do with me, and you're really mean to me, and, and so what does she decide to do? Run away. And so she's on the run. And as she's running away from her mistress, like her, the one she's supposed to be serving, an angel of the Lord, God, comes to her and says, go back and submit to her. You think that Hagar liked the word submit? Huh? The first time, this is the first time the word's used in scripture as between two women. Hagar, go back. You should be serving her. Imagine. You're, I'm out, God. You know what you've been doing to me? How I've been feeling? She's harsh with me. She's not kind to me. I don't want to do that. And God says, go back and submit to her. You're her maidservant. You're to be faithful to her. That's the first context of the word submit. Next. Now we jump forward. The next time it's used, we, we're in Genesis 41. Lots has happened. Joseph has been sold off from, by his brothers. He lands in Egypt. God blesses him. He's a really good manager. So good that Pharaoh says, hey, hey Joseph, you'll be in charge of my palace. All the people in Egypt. By the way, he's a foreigner. Imagine this is going to go over. All the people in Egypt are to submit to your orders. 
only with respect to the throne will I do good you. I trust you so much. I'm going to give the reins over to you. Manage your kingdom. They're the world power of the day. It's the world power. It's like our president going over to one of our enemy countries and bringing a person over and saying, hey, you, you, run, you run the show. Wow. That sounds used second time in scripture. I wonder if the people there are just a little bit um, worried. What's going on? Has Sarah lost his mind? He wants us to submit to this guy? He's a foreigner. He's not one of us. But you know the rest of the story. That was pretty important, wasn't it? Because by submitting to Pharaoh, to, to Joseph, they did what Joseph said. They stored their grain for years. So when the world famine came by, they had food and fed the world. Pretty important. God knew. God knew what was coming. And so when he directs Pharaoh to have Joseph submit, it was for good reason. 2 Chronicles 30, verse 1. Here we have a different context. Do not be stiff-necked as your ancestors were. Submit to the Lord. If you know the Old Testament history, what were the people of Israel always doing? Complaining, more than complaining. Turn away and worship other gods. They always wanted it their way. Always doing their own thing. And got them in trouble time and time again. I mean, it's a graphic story of not wanting to submit. If you think the word was hard for us in our culture today, it was no different from the very beginning. We have a problem submitting to the Lord. All right. And then when we go through the rest of the Old Testament, it's kind of like this. Submit to God and yet peace with Him. In this way, prosperity will come with you. Um, there are lots of references in from that time forward with the word submit that talk about our relationship with God. Submitting to God. And by the way, we have a truth that talks about that, don't we? What is it? His will is what's best for us. I like to put another word in there. His will is always best for us. Always. That's pretty important. Because we like to, you know, barter with God. Not today, tomorrow maybe. Or on Sunday, fine, but not on Monday. His will is always best for us. And yet we, man turned in on himself, does not want to submit to anyone or anything else. We want to have our way. That's the part of our brokenness and the fall. Evident in the Old Testament people, evident in the New Testament people, and evident in us today. Psalm 81 says, But my people would not listen to me. Israel would not submit to me. That's kind of commentary from God. Ah, they just won't submit to me. What's wrong? What's going on? Why is it so hard? Proverbs 3, verse 6, and the positive in all your ways submit to him, and he'll make your paths straight. I can hear pastor guys still saying, you know, when we keep God's commands, when we live according to his will, things generally what? Go better for us. They generally go better for us when we follow his will for our lives. When we don't, we get ourselves into all sorts of jams, don't we? 
We really do. We think we know his best, and we do it and we realize, ah, oh, what's I think? His will is best. And all your ways submit to him, and he won't make your paths straight. All right. That's just a, a review from the Old Testament. And I can give more passages about submitting to the Lord your God. I think we understand that. Yeah. Job 22, 21, I'm sorry. Yeah. Now we move to the New Testament. Okay? And the Gospel of Luke, we find this passage. The 77, or the 72, returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. You know, Jesus sends them out two by two to do some missionary work. And they come back, with, you know, after a while they come back and like rehashing things and they all come to you and say, wow, this was amazing. Even the demons submit to you. What does that say? What does that add to the word for you? I think that really hits home with the first truth. It's all his. That means God is God. Or not. God is God even of the demons. They can't have their way with him. And the early disciples were shocked that even the demons had to submit to the word of the Lord. But here's what's really cool. What Jesus tells them. Do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you. But rejoice that your names are written in heaven. What's our third truth? I mean, it's the second truth in order, but we haven't talked about it. He saves. Well, we've just, re we've just reviewed our theology. It's all his. He has the right to tell us to submit to him because he's God. His will is what's best. We ought to submit to him. It goes well for us. He saves. Notice, God is not interested in blind obedience for obedience sake. That's not the end game. Oh, the demons, they even submit to you. And Jesus says, okay, all right, I mean, I know, you know, I'm a part, I'm a part of creation. That shouldn't really surprise you too much. But what I'm really interested in is your salvation. That's really important. Because the God whose word we are studying today, who used the word submit in our relationship with, with each other, is not out to what? Pound us in the ground. He's not out to destroy us or take advantage of us or get the upper hand on us. What does he want? Our hearts. He wants us to be his people. He wants our names written in the book of life. He wants to be our God. He wants us to be his people. One of my favorite phrases in scripture. I've got lots of them. That's probably up there though in the top ten. Maybe the top five. God says, I want to be your God 
I want you to be my people. Would you submit to me? Because when you want to have it your way, guess what? You always want to make yourself God. I want to be your God. And I want you to be my people. So this word is really important. We have to be able to embrace this word as Christian folk here in West Bend in all of its beauty. The God of all creation wants us to submit to Him because He wants us to be His people and He to be our God. He wants our names written in the book of life. Does that put this word in a really good spot? Huh? You see? It's not this heavy hand, this fist. And a lot of people think of God that way. But look, these are his own words. They come, look, the demons submit to you. Forget about that. I'm not after blind submission. I want. Come back and tell me about the people that you share me with. I sent you out two by two, right? I'm interested in the people whose names are written in the book of life. I want to expand my kingdom of grace to the world. I desperately want to be your God and to be my people. Can we say we like the word submit? Huh? The psalmist says, I love your law. I think, oh man, that's not me. I don't always love the law. I bump against it all the time. I want to do it my way. Jane knows that. But God really wants me. He wants you. He wants us to submit to him. Because he is God who loves us and wants us to be his people for eternity. All right, let's go on. And there we dig in a little more, a little more, a little bit. Especially with November coming up very soon. Romans 8. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. This is kind of a lead-in. By the way, what Paul is saying is, hey, this is an easy word. Was well, it easy for Hagar? I can just imagine what was going through her mind, right? You've got to be crazy. Really? You want me to go back in that harsh treatment? And she did, and the treatment was harsh. And she ended up having Ishmael, and they left. The mind governed by the flesh, man turned in on himself, in our brokenness and sin, in our natural condition of who we are. We're hostile to God. We don't want to listen to Him. By word what? Is a Psalm 119, that verse, I, I picked that for a reason. Because we oftentimes are hostile to God's word. That, that, that verse sounds so beautiful, doesn't it? Thy word is a light to my feet and a light to my path. It sounds so, it just flows so nice and it feels so good. But you know what? We're hostile to it. And you hear it again. Your word. Our natural flesh does not submit to God's law. And then that last phrase is really important. Nor what? That's how broken we are. Of ourselves, we are helpless and hopelessly lost. That's the truth of the matter. That means we all struggle with the word submit. There's a one person here who doesn't struggle with it. Amen. 
Thanks be to God for truth number two. He saves. Romans 10. Since they did not know the righteousness of God and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. What is God's righteousness? Boy, there are some loaded words in that passage. What is God's righteousness? Christ. Right? God's righteousness is His Son. He is our righteousness. And we really don't want to submit to Christ. And then in Romans 13, Therefore it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also a matter of conscience. Paul gets it. We got a problem with this word submit. And you know, the people really wanted what the Jews want at Jesus' day more than anything else. What they want? They want to release from the Romans who had them under submission. That's what they want. They want to be out of the heavy thumb of the Romans. And Jesus didn't fill the bill. And they were disappointed. And so that's still a part of their culture. So what do they need to be reminded of? The authority of the government. Yeah. The authority of the government. I don't know what's going to happen in November. But I'm sure some people will be disappointed. Either way. Doesn't matter what happens. Maybe about 50% of the population will not be very happy. Do we just go off on our own? Like Hagar? I'm out of here. What does Paul say? Submit to the authorities. Because God says no authority comes by its own. I establish the authorities. I expect you to submit to them. Not only say don't punish, you know, we don't throw them in jail, but as a matter of conscience, as who we are, as God's people. You know, if your not unbelieving friend has a problem with submit, and you have some conversation with them, and then when you go about your your life in the world and um, share some rather less than submissive words about authority and government, what breaks down? Our witness. Paul recognizes that. He's writing to God's people. To the church in Rome. Not to the heathen, he's writing to the church in Rome. God's people. This is important for a witness to the world. And the world's watching. <clears throat> and we mentioned that in Ephesians 5. This is the text that usually is the real stumbling block. And um, the author, actually when I, um, I texted Heather Davis this week, and asked her if she had some insights. And one of her first things was, yeah, one of the insights is that when this text is usually preached on or, or comes up in the pericopes, the lectionary, the lessons for the day, for a Sunday, a lot of times they start with verse 22 and not verse 21. That's what she's experienced. And that's really sad. I don't know what that says about us, but 
really 21 is really important because 21 establishes it all. If you don't get 21 in Ephesians 5, you miss the point. So here it is, folks. Paul says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. I want to take a moment, look you back in your groups and ask, what does that mean in real terms? Go ahead, talk about it. What does that passage mean? Okay, we're going to just stop the conversation right there because I do want to get through this whole process and we'll come back and hopefully if we have some time. Would you read that passage together with me? <laughs> Paul's writing to Christians in Ephesus. That's not, that's written for Christians. Hey, you people who follow Christ, and then called by and follow Christ. Submit yourselves to one another out of reverence for Christ. Let's read the next passage together. This is a stumbling block. This is a loaded passage. So let's look at it more closely. By the way, are just male voices reading this? Yeah. <laughs> oh boy. Oh, I decided to change that. <laughs> um, what makes this passage difficult for us to hear? Well, we just want to spend more time because I need to get through this. Um, a closer look at the language. Pastor Jeff said to me, and I have to say it on the brief, and that's, I wish I did, but I, I don't. So I have to, um, I have to trust scholars. And by the way, there are lots of Greek scholars. And Pastor Jeff knows Greek quite well. And it says the verb there is hupotasso. That's what he pronounces, so I just have to hypotasso. He said hupotasso. The tasso is, is the Greek verb that's used in that phrase. If you look at the Greek language. And here's how he described it for us. One of my jobs at Thanksgiving when I was living at home, when mom was doing all the cooking, was she'd say, Dave, we're just at the table. And it was really easy because somewhere along the line, mom said, well, Dave, the forks go on the left, you got the plate in the middle, you got the knife on the right, 
and you got the spoon on the right of it. Then you got the glasses above the knife and the spoon. And then the, the napkin, well, you know, you got a fancy napkin at Thanksgiving, you go on the plate. It's so easy to set the table because I know where things go. If I had asked my mom, you know, which, which thing you want today, you know, it, just, it would just make life more challenging. And so you can say that order is a gift. Without order, we have lots of chaos. And this is just something really simple you can see, like a table setting. It's just really simple. It's very universal. Most of you probably would say, yeah, I've seen that before. I know that. You know, I'm not sure any of you do. It just makes it really simple. You go to a restaurant, that's how it is. Sometimes that can maybe be on the left of the forks. You pick up the napkin, put it on your, on your, on your lap, and, and then you know whose who's, um, glass is whose. That's a really good thing to do. Is that your glass or my glass? Well, which one's above your knife and your spoon? That's your glass. Okay? It just provides order, right? Well, this verb, hupotasso, the root meaning of the Greek verb means to rank people or things in order under a specific pattern. It doesn't have the charged nature of suppressing someone. The way we hear that word, someone's got their heavy hand upon me. No. In the Greek, it's talking about an order of pattern, a ranking. That just is the way it is that provides less chaos in life. God doesn't have it in for women and have it up for men. That's just not the case at all. But God, in infinite wisdom, decided on an order. If you don't like it, I can say take up with God. <laughs> I, we did this, the church didn't decide that order. Paul did, I'll show you this moment, Paul didn't decide that order. And some people say, uh, Paul's just got it in for women. That's not the case at all. God has decided on this order because he loves us and knows that order is very helpful. It's like a table setting. There's no reason to challenge it. It's the way it is, and so we just do it. We just, you know, you don't want something else. Let's not worry about that. Okay, let's go on here. So here's how it probably reads in the Greek, more, more literally than, than the text we have from ESV or the NIV or King James. Being subject to one another out of reverence for Christ, wives are to their own husbands as to the Lord, because the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. That's probably how, more clearly how it looked in the Greek. Being subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. That's really important. You see, we all have skin in the game here. It isn't a one-way street here. Paul say, we all need to submit to each other. And we'll talk more about that in just a moment. Out of our reverence for Christ, wives are to their own husbands as the Lord. So just like that. See, he's not pulling them out and saying, hey, you do something different. He's saying, in this relationship, Wives, you're on the left of the plate. Husbands, you're on the right of the plate. Oh, I want to be on the left. I'm going to... See? That's what he's saying here. If you have a business, how many businessmen do we have in here? Five like businessmen? It's kind of important to have a CEO, isn't it? And some have someone who's in charge of operations, some are in charge of facilities, some are in charge of finances. You put different people in different places for a good cause, for the good of business. And God says, 
for the good of the marriage, here's how it's going to work. And what do we do? In our man turning on suffer brokenness, we say, not fair, I don't like it. Um, you know, we, we, we just start to just discount it completely. But this is God's gift to marriage. His order. Just like the table setting is a gift, is setting on the table of Thanksgiving, so this order is God's gift for husband and wife. Paul didn't make, make it up. If you go back to Genesis chapter 3, third chapter, what's Genesis 3 all about? The fall. Thank you. It's about man breaking God's command. God gave him one thing not to do. Don't eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. If you do, you'll surely die. He didn't surprise him full fast when he told him what the consequence would be. He said, no. They did. And God looks to the serpent and he gives us the promise of Savior. I'll put enmity between you and the woman, between your seat and her seat. You know, he'll bruise your head and heal him, crush his head. I, you know, promise of Savior there. And then he turns to me and says, Eve, because of your own disobedience, It'll be painful to have children. And by the way, I want you to have lots of them. And by the way, she had lots of pain. She had lots of kids. You look through those first generations, I mean, they would be like 950 years. Had lots and lots and lots of kids. There was lots and lots of pain. There just was. That's the way it was. And along with that, he says, and your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. That's where the, that's where the order is established. By God. Paul didn't make up the order. God established it. And he spoke this to fallen Eve. And she probably said, oh, I don't like what he just said. <clears throat> and then he turned to Adam and said, Adam, thorns and thistles will grow up. But so your brow, you'll make it through life. And isn't that true? It's really hard to make it through life. You've got to work, and, and things just don't work out well. That's from the fall. God says this is the way it will be. So Paul's not making up something new here. He's going way back to Genesis 3. God has an order for the world, a plan for things. Man has to bring God's character and leadership to bear. By the way, I didn't write this. Thank you, Pastor Jeff Gordon. Okay? Here's what he says. God has an order in the world, a plan for things. Man is to bring God's character and leadership to bear, his dominion into creation to love, care, and serve by his design. This includes the marriage relationship. He told man, you'll have dominion. Bring my character, my leadership into all creation, the way you manage. And he says to the husband, bring my character and my leadership into the marriage relationship. And Paul says, husbands, love your wife as yourself. And when we live in God's will and faithful to him, this submission is less and less of a problem. It's when we live outside of God's will that it becomes a really big problem. My cousin's being abusive. That's not a part of God's will, is it? You're going to love and care for your, for your wives. And when we live outside of God's will, it makes it really difficult. But it doesn't change God's will for our lives. You see? So the problem isn't with God or Paul, the problem is with me, with us, and our brokenness. 
But we always want to put it off on someone else and master of that. Just ship the Bible. Rather than hear what God's word has to say to us. So it goes on, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Well, let's read this together. That sounds so great and, and, and super and, and easy and, and maybe um, a high platitude, but in reality, this means Jesus had to say yes to the Father's will that he would die. And in the garden, what's he saying? If there's some other way, I really don't care to go through with this. This is, this is almost too much for me. But Jesus submitted to the Father's will. And it cost him what? His life, his very life. Submitting to the Father's will is not a walk in the park. It's just not. It never has been. This slow word is a challenge for us. <coughs> it always has been. It required everything of Jesus. And he says now, husbands, what do you like us? And I guarantee you, husbands, if we could do that, why is there no problem submission? There would be any problem. I'm convinced of it. If we could do what Paul says here for us, it wouldn't be an issue. They say, I'm so thankful that God's given you to me. I am so cared for, protected. I'm so loved. What a blessing. What a gift. Okay, go, go fast. Hebrews 13. Um, have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you, those who put the account. So this whole business of submission and authority also goes to us gathered as a church. Finally, in verse Peter 2, 13, submit yourselves as the Lord to every human authority. A lot to ponder there. And here's what I wanted to get in the slide, because you can't close up the slide. To submit is to willingly give up your immediate need, want, or preference out of love for God and your neighbor. That's a fill in the blank on your sheet. To submit is to willingly give up your immediate need, want, or preference out of love for God and your neighbor. How's that sound? From what we've read in God's Word, you see that? I'm willing to give up what I want for the good of God and my neighbor. That sounds like a summary of the commandments, doesn't it? Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. That's not loaded, that's a computer term. You filled out a survey of form and says submit now. <laughs> we go out, okay? That's not loaded at all. People who go, oh, I'll take that button any day, you know? I filled out a form, I've got this application in, I've been here the sweet sake, so submit now, you click on it, right? It's easy. So submit isn't always difficult. All right. And submit now is, don't forget to check out your name on the list, okay? And your name's not there, add it to it. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the gift of life we have in your name. Lord, your word challenges us. Yet it's your word. 
and your will for our life. And so we pray, Lord, you help us to grow as your disciples with love for you and love for neighbor. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for coming. Check off. Have a great day.